Okay. Great. Can everybody see this okay on screen? Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. And Angie, are we ready to go? The recording? Yes, the recording has already started. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on interventions to support healthy eating in universities and colleges. The point of the webinar today is to share evidence based approaches to improve the food environments in post secondary institutions to help build capacity and stimulate action in Canada. We're also going to talk about some of the great examples of healthy eating interventions happening right now across Canada on post secondary campuses. I'm very grateful to Health Canada for funding this work, including the report that I'll be talking about as well as this webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to Alfred now to say a few words about. Thank you, Leah. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. My name is Alfred Aziz, and I'm the Director General of the Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion at Health Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on healthy eating interventions in universities and colleges, evidence and implementation. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that since I'm in Ottawa, I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Nation. I recognize that we may all be in different places and therefore you may be in different traditional indigenous territory. I strongly encourage you to take a moment to reflect on that and acknowledge it. Le Bureau de la promotion et la, la politique en matière de nutrition est le principal responsable de l'hygiène alimentaire publique au gouvernement fédéral. Nous nous efforçons de promouvoir la santé nutritionnelle et le bien-être des personnes vivant au Canada. Les principales fonctions du Bureau comprennent l'élaboration de recommandations alimentaires, la surveillance alimentaire et nutritionnelle, la recherche et l'analyse des données, la promotion de la santé et la politique d'hygiène alimentaire publique. L'une de nos principales activités est l'élaboration et la promotion du Guide alimentaire canadien. Nous promouvons le Guide alimentaire et, et sensibilisons les gens à une alimentation saine de diverses façons. Pour que nos activités promotionnelles et éducatives soient efficaces, il est essentiel que les environnements soient favorables à une saine alimentation. C'est pour cette raison que lorsque le Guide alimentaire a été mis en jour en 2019, il comprenait une recommandation pour que les institutions financées par des fonds publics et d'autres milieux comme les lieux de travail et les commerces de vente au détail proposent, proposent des options plus saines et limitent la disponibilité d'aliments et de boissons hautement transformés. C'est pourquoi nous avons besoin de partenaires pour une alimentation saine dans divers milieux sur le terrain. En tant que personne et organisation intéressée à promouvoir des environnements alimentaires sains sur les campus canadiens, nous, nous espérons que vous comprendrez la valeur de cette approche. So that's why, as uh, we need partners to help, uh, like to, to help partners in, in healthy eating in different settings and on the ground. Uh, as organizations, as individuals who are interested in promoting healthy food environments on campuses, we really hope that today you will be, see the value of this approach. Supporting children and youth to develop healthy eating behaviors is important for the future and health, for the future health of society. It has even become more apparent over the past years, two years in particular, during the pandemic, that healthy eating is an important factor in preventing severe outcome of infectious diseases. As we have seen people with diet related chronic diseases and obesity suffering worse outcomes from COVID. From a, for a more resilient population, we must support people to make healthy food choices early in life. And where better to reach them than when they are taking their first step towards independence as, as young adults. Over the last two years, we have been collaborate, collaborating on some key initiatives on Canadian campuses to help encourage changes to the food environment. You'll be hearing about some of these initiatives today. The research that has helped guide our approach to support healthy eating on campuses includes an evidence synthesis that Leah Menniker has done for us. She will moderate today's webinar and present the key findings from her report to you. But also in order to bring the research to life during today's webinar, we wanted to share some examples of activities to improve the food environment on campuses across Canada. Our partners and collaborators at the University of British Columbia will share their experiences with encouraging healthier options in dining halls, including an initiative we have funded as a pilot. 
The initiative was developed to encourage improvements to the food environments by recognizing actions that organizations, including post-secondary institutions, have taken and that are aligned with the food guide recommendations. We are interested in further collaboration, so would love to hear from other campuses interested in helping us advance this work. Our colleagues at the University of Guelph will share information about their recent innovation, the campus fresh food market. And last but not least, colleagues from Meal Exchange will provide an overview of some of the initiatives that their student ambassadors have been involved with. We have been so impressed with that, what the student ambassadors have accomplished in the past two years. We have allocated some time at the end of the presentations for, Q, for questions and discussion. I would also like to add that in addition to the evidence synthesis Leia did for us on the campus food environment, she also did one on recreation centers and retail food setting. She's going to make all three of these documents available to you after the webcast. Now I'll turn things over back to you, Leia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so just very briefly an outline and then we're going to do a poll to see who's joining us today. So first we're going to talk about some of the research. Um, we'll describe post-secondary institutions as important settings for health promotion in Canada. Then we'll go over the evidence on effectiveness um, of the interventions that have been done in these settings and talk about some of the key barriers of facilitators to implementation. Then as Alfred mentioned, we're going to hear about three different case studies actually a bit more than three, there's gonna be three different kind of present group presentations with a lot of case studies within them. Um, and I'm now going to run a poll just to see who's here. So let me know if you can see this. Oh. So it looks like we have 20, oh, most of the people here so far are from post-secondary um, institutions, followed looks like by local public health units. And then yeah, just give it, there's 23 people who haven't responded, so we'll give them maybe just another 30 seconds or so. Excellent. So it looks like we have almost 40 people here from the post-secondary sector. So that's excellent. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, and just so everyone's aware, this webinar is also being recorded for colleagues who might not have been able to make it. Um, and it will be made available um, on the Meal Exchange website on their YouTube channel as well. And so we can send a link um, to all the participants at the end of uh, when, it's, when it's posted. Great, thank you very much for participating in the poll. Okay, so on we go. Right, and then I'll briefly talk about some conclusions, recommendations and resources that are available and we'll have some time for questions, I hope at the end as well. So I wanted to start with why do we care about post-secondary institutions? Um, so first of all, Health Canada uh, launched a healthy eating strategy in October 2016. The strategy is a multi-pronged approach to improve the food environment and enable Canadians to make healthier choices. The Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion, or ONPP, is working with others to create supportive environments that offer food choices, healthier food choices, and promote eating habits aligned with Canada's food guide, as Alfred mentioned. The World Health Organization endorses a healthy settings approach which is a settings-based approach to health promotion that intends to maximize disease prevention via a whole systems approach, recognizing that health is created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday life, where they learn, work, play, and live. And as part of the healthy eating strategy in late 2019, I reviewed academic and gray literature and wrote a scoping review for Health Canada to summarize evidence on the effectiveness of healthy eating interventions in universities and colleges on both organizational or sort of food sales, as well as individual level or consumer level behaviors outcomes. There were also two secondary objectives. Number one, I wanted to assess which intervention components have been identified as sort of crucial to the success of the interventions. And number two, to assess what barriers and facilitators to intervention implementation exist. 
The content of this web webinar draws heavily on the review, but I've made some updates to the content because this um, because this field of research is quickly developing, and of course, we'll hear from our colleagues as well. So, in 2019, 2.15 million students were enrolled in post-secondary institutions across Canada. And during post-secondary education, many young adults are making transitions from living at home with their families to living more independently. This major life transition um, forces young adults to start developing their own habits, routines, and preferences, including food and dietary decisions. And many of these persist into their later adulthood. Attending university is also associated with unhealthy dietary and physical activity changes and weight gain. Statistics Canada data suggests that in 2018, over 560,000 students graduated from a post-secondary institution. So the reach of post-secondary institutions for young people, as well as for all the faculty and staff who work at universities and colleges across Canada is, is pretty large. So that's over half a million people every year that are emerging from these settings where they have just spent usually between three and five years of their lives, and they typically move into an even more independent setting. So there's an opportunity to make a huge impact by intervening in these settings where we have a slightly captive audience of over 2 million Canadians every year who are spending three to five years of a really important transition period. So in terms of intervention effectiveness, and this, there's much more detail about this in the actual review, but roughly um, there were, I reviewed 30 articles for the report on intervention effectiveness. There were 13 literature reviews and 17 primary studies. So I've broken these results into two major sections. Number one, the settings in which interventions are typically implemented on campus. And number two, the intervention strategies that are typically used. So since then, there have been several more articles, as I mentioned, that have come out, and I'm going to just briefly touch on those as well. So first and foremost, uh, of the 27 primary research articles that I reviewed, most of them, or 17 of them, took place in cafeterias and dining halls. So this was, by and large, in the research, um, the, the predominant setting for intervention. Five of the studies were conducted in university restaurants, Four were conducted in campus on in campus vending machines, and one was conducted in a campus grocery store. So just under half or 48% of the studies I reviewed used multi-component interventions, and 52% used a single component intervention. So a multi-component intervention would have been something like changing price and promotion, or maybe price and placement of an item or those kinds of things. So more than one intervention component. So about half did more than one and half only did one component. For example, um, signage, promotions, um, et cetera. There was also um, a very recent systematic review from 2022 that examined the specific nudging interventions. So nudging being, you know, changing the position of something, making it a little more appealing without taking people's choices away. It's making the, the healthier choice a little easier or a little more of a default decision for people. Um, and that, that study found that, um, and they were all done in university cafeterias, and it found that most um, of the interventions reviewed focused on more than one food item or category, and that nudging interventions were successful in 77% of the studies done. There's another recent review that looked specifically at vending machine interventions on campus, and found that 62% of them uh, reported positive changes in the outcomes, including both increased number or percent of sales or revenue from healthier items, as well as improved adherence to guidelines for the ratio of healthy to unhealthy products available and improved consumer perception of items. So as I'm sure you can imagine, because most of our diets and most students' diets don't come just from vending machines, it's hard uh, in this research to kind of capture the impact on overall diet quality, but vending machines are um, kind of a, a very unique situation in that they often there's a policy of, with vending machines and so they can be um, treated as one on many campuses. So in terms of intervention strategies, the most commonly used intervention strategy was promotions. And that could be signage, signs, stickers, posters to identify more nutritious meals, snacks, or beverage options. 
nine of the 14 studies I reviewed that um, examined promotion, promotional strategies, found significant impacts of the intervention on a diet-related outcome. Um, in terms of nutrition information, only about a third of post-secondary students report using nutrition labels often or always, and this tends to be higher among women and those who value healthy diets. So eight of 13 studies, or 60% of those studies, found significant impacts in the intervention on diet-related outcomes. Most of the studies that, or interventions that used nutrition information also used um, promotion. And in terms of systematic reviews focused on food labeling and menu labeling, Food labeling was found to be effective in reducing consumer consumption of energy and fat and increasing vegetable consumption, but does not seem to be effective in changing other dietary targets with this population. Whereas menu labeling seems to show more modest effects um, on student dietary outcomes. And contextual menu labels like traffic light labels or exercise equivalents um, are better, had sort of showed better effectiveness related than um, calorie only information. In terms of nudging, reviews that have examined nudging suggest that nudges seem to be effective in improving di dietary choices on campuses. So interventions that increase availability of, of um, healthy options, controlled portion sizes, or provided small price incentives were more effective than labeling or signage on their own. But a major gap in knowledge is how healthy defaults still affect choices. So there hasn't been enough research done on that. In terms of the positional study, so this would be something like moving um, in, in a buffet line, for example, moving the salad to the front rather than having it at the back, um, or moving healthier snacks to the eye level um, rather than and moving the unhealthier snacks to the bottom or the top of something that's a little bit more out of reach. Those would be positional interventions. And of those seven studies that I reviewed, five of them, so 71%, um, showed significant impacts on diet-related outcomes, and four of those five successful studies used promotion as well as position to change behaviors. In terms of availability, there were four studies that increased nutritious food availability, and they showed mixed results. So availability on its own, for example, did not seem to alter vending machine choices in one study, but availability and promotion together did seem to improve um, choices in another study. Um, in terms of portion, so there was only one study that looked at this, which I thought was interesting. Um, they reduced, they looked at the impact of reducing French fry portion sizes and found a decreased intake of French fries, as well as decreased plate waste and no compensatory behavior among patrons. So they actually followed them over time and thought, well, maybe if they get, if we give them less French fries at lunch, then they'll eat more at dinner time to make up for it. And they found, no, that didn't actually happen. What happened was they reduced the portion sizes, people ate less french fries um, but then before, and also the plate waste was reduced. So that kind of had two great outcomes. Um, finally, or with price, only three studies looked at pricing interventions on campuses, and only one of those looked at price separately from other intervention components and found no effect. So there hasn't been too, too much research done on price interventions. Um, and then in terms of nutrition education, um, the research that I reviewed was pretty critically low quality of evidence regarding how nutrition education on campuses affects student diets. So in terms of some of the common implementation barriers and facilitators, um, in general, complex catering procurement and provision policies and processes um, was one of the major barriers so that uh, when you would talk to food service operators or other um, people who were sort of charged with food provision on campus, they would say, well, we have all these policies already in place. Um, a lack, another big barrier was a lack of consumer demand for healthy foods, or at least a perceived lack of demand. Um, and inadequate facility infrastructure for preparation and storage of healthy foods. Those were the major barriers. In terms of vending machines, the main barriers um, identified to improving nutritional quality of vending machine foods and drinks were concerns, of course, about revenue loss, lack of student demand, and then difficulty enforcing healthy vending machine policies even when they exist. But that said, many students are dissatisfied with the nutritional quality of the foods available in vending machines and elsewhere on campus. So I know. And I know that this was a facilitators and barriers section, and I didn't describe any of the facilitators yet, 
This will come towards the end. And if you listen carefully to the following case studies, I'm sure you'll also be able to identify some of the factors that help the programs you're about to learn about succeed. So with that, I would like to invite Julie to come talk to us about the experience at the University of British Columbia. Thank you. Hello, I'm Julie Sashu, Manager of Nutrition and Wellbeing at the UBC Okanagan campus, which is located on the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Silks Okanagan people. Today, I'm looking forward to sharing two examples of initiatives that UBC has been working on to promote healthier eating in higher education. Next slide. As one of the first universities in the world to adopt the Okanagan Charter, an international charter for health promoting colleges and universities, UBC has made a significant commitment to supporting the health and well being of our community members and has a responsibility and an opportunity to adopt practices that improve the health of the people who live, work, learn, and play on our campuses. Aligning with this is our drive to promote healthy eating in higher education, with an example of this being the food and nutrition targets found within our UBC Wellbeing Strategic Framework, one of which is a reduction in sugar-sweetened beverage consumption by 50% on our campuses by 2025. Next slide. Sugar-sweetened beverages are drinks containing added sugar, such as pop. Sugary drinks are the leading contributor of added sugar in the diet and often offer no nutritional benefit, which can result in health and well-being implications. We know that young Canadians consume more, almost double the amount of sugary drinks compared to the general population, and that post-secondary years are a crucial time for developing lifelong healthy habits. By supporting our students' health and well-being now, we can help set them up for success in the future. And one way we can do this is by helping ensure that there's access to nourishing food and beverages and the necessary information to help make healthy choices. Next slide. Considering the alarming health and economic burden caused by drinking sugary beverages, the UBC Food and Nutrition Committee collaborated with students, staff, faculty, and other stakeholders to explore ways to better promote drinking water and reduce sugary beverage consumption at UBC. From this, a healthy beverage initiative was launched, which is an important step towards our changing, or sorry, towards changing our on-campus environment to better support well-being by making the healthy choice the easy choice. Focus areas within the Healthy Beverage Initiative, or HBI, promote water consumption and phasing out the sales of sugary drinks at UBC. Next slide. To assess if we're reducing sugar sweetened beverage consumption at UBC, we have a working group who monitors indicators as seen on this slide, as well as takes on initiatives to propel the HBI forward. The HBI working group is currently striving to accomplish two key milestones to help us reach our target. Next slide. One of these milestones will include creating um, a certification program for food providers and events, which would provide recognition for and encouragement of our vendors who align with HBI guidelines by reducing sugary drinks and increasing the provision of healthy beverages. We have created HBI guidelines, which you can see on the slide, and these help guide procurement decisions as well as HBI awareness. Currently, these guidelines are being reviewed to see if they require updating from both a content and a visual standpoint with student led research informing this process. Next slide. The other milestone focuses on developing and adopting supportive policies, practices, and guidelines to help change the UBC food environment so that there's more availability of healthy beverages. Research in behavioral economics and public health shows that people mostly make food and drink choices based on convenience and accessibility. We also know from research that health education alone in the absence of environmental change does not often produce lasting behaviors and the lasting changes in health behaviors. Many students are living on their own for the first time and are forming habits for life. So it's important to help them shape healthy habits and provide environments that promote and nudge towards healthy choices. A recent success has been transitioning our campus vending machines to be compliant with our healthy beverage initiative, resulting in a significant reduction in availability of sugary drinks at the university. 100% of the Okanagan and over 70% of the Vancouver campus vending machines are now compliant with our HBI. 
and the achievement of the HBI milestones, in addition to the stakeholder oversight structure and working group action, will assist with the sustainability of the Healthy Beverage Initiative. Next slide. A common concern that gets brought up with the HBI is that sales will be affected. However, research projects conducted at UBC and elsewhere show that sales are not affected by decreasing sugary beverage options. Another challenge is the argument of restricting people's choice to choose the beverage they want. And it's not about, um, or sorry, it's important to consider that a pouring rights contract is already restricting product choice. And it's not about restricting people's freedom to choose what to drink. It's about aligning with our values as an institution and putting our community's health first in what we choose to sell. We've shared our HBI experience with Health Canada to help inform resources. And we also have a website if you're interested in learning more about UBC's Healthy Beverage Initiative. Up next, and on behalf of my research team, I'd like to share a project that UBC has undertaken in partnership with financial support from Health Canada. The research project focuses on examining the effectiveness of promotional nudges to promote the selection of plant-based options. Next slide. Residence dining halls provide numerous opportunities for food literacy interventions, social connection encouragement, and behavior change. First year students living in residence um, often have mandatory meal plans and therefore are a captive audience when it comes to the what, when, where, why, and how they explore their relationship with food and food choices. Based on this, institutions have a responsibility to offer a variety of healthy foods to ensure that students have the best chance at academic success. And additionally, this environment is an ideal setting for focusing on the promotion of plant-based diets, as this aligns with priorities around planetary health and well-being. Based on all this, the research project sought to implement and evaluate menu-based, food display, and other promotional changes, um, known as nudges, which Leia spoke to earlier, to increase the likelihood of a diner selecting a plant-based option in two types of dining hall models, a traditional declining balance model and a buffet or all you care to eat uh, dining hall model. To promote plant-based eating, the three main areas the literature focuses on to intervene are taste, variety, and display. Taste is the main driver of meal selection. If the plant-based meal options available are not as appealing or delicious as their meat-based alternatives, it'll be very difficult to convince diners to shift to a more plant-based diet. Secondly, by increasing the variety of plant-based foods, it's more likely the diners will be able to find an item they enjoy within that category. And finally, the layout of the menu has an important influence on what students may choose to consume and what items their eyes are drawn to. So our study focused on the third section, which is highlighting plant-based meals and menu design. Next slide. Changes to the menu were made to list plant-based items first on the menu, and words that highlighted the meatless aspect of the dish were removed. Food descriptors such as healthy or light were also removed, as the literature shows that these words enhance diners' preconceived notion about the lack of tastiness of plant-based foods. Instead, we focused, or instead we used um, taste-focused naming with guidance from Stan Stanford's Edgy Veggie Toolkit to emphasize those tasteful qualities, such as the texture adjectives on the slide. Next slide. The next area for intervention was the chef recommendation, where we selected a few dishes from the already established menu to promote each week. The rationale behind this was that drawing attention to a single menu item, um, so a recommended choice, has been shown to have a positive impact on the selection of that option. And like other nudges, it's about helping the consumer bypass the decision-making process. Additionally, we had promotional material developed by Health Canada in consultation with our marketing team. The posters and social media posts focused on three different themes, which were to promote plant-based proteins, promote fruits and veggies, and promote whole grains. By covering these three areas, we encourage students to select healthier items in line with Canada's food guide. In order to have a successful implementation, there were several key stakeholders engaged in this project. First off were the dietitians working in food service, as they had the same goal in improving what students eat and also have relationships with the other stakeholders. We also collaborated with McMaster and Waterloo University dietitians to help ensure the project deliverables included the context and applicability of multiple Canadian universities. 
to get buy-in to make changes in the dining hall, it was important to get the food service management team involved. And we also recognized that while our focus was on increasing the consumption of healthier meals, dining hall staff are busy making sure that the dining hall operates smoothly. So it was our job to make any changes as easy as possible for them, which included training and education. The marketing team was essential in the product project delivery as they developed and launched study and marketing materials that met standards and research criteria. And of course, the students who were the target audience of the program. Next slide. We ran the interventions for six weeks during this recent winter semester. The structure of each dining hall was a little different, so we're using multiple methods of data collection to evaluate whether our changes have any effect. For indicators of plant-based meal consumption, we're analyzing sales data, as well as a pre and post intervention survey. To provide context for what we might see in that data, we also had taste surveys, which captured student feedback on the dining hall meals. And these are being used to compare the rating of meat-based to plant-based options to look for reasons why students may or may not be selecting the other option. Other areas of data collection included staff surveys, social media interactions, and menu analysis. And some preliminary result results indicate that many students are interested in eating more plant-based foods. A key lesson learned when it comes to implementing nudges in a university dining hall environment is the timing of menu development. It's very important. Recipe changes and additions that promote plant-based eating need to be implemented during the menu development timeframe, which was unfortunately outside of, of our study. And when it comes to the sustainability of continuing with these initiatives, we feel optimistic as buy-in and education has already been achieved within the UBC Food Services team. So it will be a natural transition to embed these as part of our department practice and guidelines promotions. The nutrition and well-being managers or the dietitians involved in this project will be able to advocate and lead the continuous inclusion of these initiatives within the food environment within their role. And to end, thank you to all those involved in the research project and to those interested in learning more, keep your eyes peeled for a hopeful publication or feel free to email to connect further. Thank you so much. everyone. Uh, Sam Laban here from the University of Guelph. Uh, Viv, I know you're on the line. Do you want to turn your camera on and your audio on to say hi to everyone? Um, while they're doing that, Leah, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a revised end time, that would be helpful. Um, and there's also a question in the panelists uh, or in the comments about getting the slides. Uh, yes, I think I'm happy to share. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to share slides. Um, how, let's say 1243. Does that work for you? Yeah, sure. Uh, Viv, are you there? If you are. Hi, Hi Viv. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Viv, and I'm a student at the University of Guelph and a good food ambassador with Meal Exchange. Last fall, we ran a survey to learn more about uh, student food experiences and food access on campus. And we learned that there was a great need for more affordable and healthy food options. And in response to this demand, we launched a six week pilot project for an on campus sliding scale market. This was a partnership between the Aral Food Institute. Institute, hospitality, SESI, and the Sustainability Office. Next slide, please. Thank you. So at this market, fruits and veggies are priced on a sliding scale where items range from average retail prices to about 30 to 50% off. So visitors are able to pick a price within this range um, that they feel is right um, with no questions asked by us. We strive to make this market as accessible as possible, hosting it in a visible and busy location, increase foot traffic, and help to increase awareness of food security. Uh, there was also a lot of opportunity for for collaboration. We hosted a smoothie social with our campus dietitian, and we also partnered with the Guelph Family Health Study to give away free meal kits. Um, overall, the turnout exceeded our expectations and a lot of excitement was generated around the sliding scale. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Thanks, Viv, and hi, everyone. 
Um, my name is Sam Laban. I uh, work at the Guelph Lab, which is a partnership between the City of Guelph and the University of Guelph. And we have been doing research on food insecurity for the, the last few years, specifically food insecurity amongst students. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, I think it's clear that food insecurity is a significant barrier to healthy eating. Uh, we know that's reflected in Canada's food guide and dietary guidelines. And the community food market launched in large part due to concerns about the high prevalence of food insecurity among students. Um, we know with you know, increasing numbers of studies are being done on campus and, and huge credit here should go to Meal Exchange. Their 2015 survey uh, was a real tra trailblazer in that regard. Uh, these studies are consistently seeing rates of food insecurity uh, between 20 and 40 percent of students. Um, and of course, clearly this is a significant barrier to healthy eating because uh, some of the ways in which we assess food insecurity actually speak to the experiences around healthy eating. Um, students are considered food insecure when they often or always experience common indicators of food insecurity, which touch on things around healthy eating. Uh, to put that in concrete terms, uh, at the University of Guelph, uh, we did a study in 2019 of prevalence uh, after 1,000 students. Um, and what we saw is that a third of all students uh, sacrifice healthy food options because of other essential costs. For Guelph, you know, projecting out, that's approximately 10,000 students who sacrifice healthy food options because they have to pay for rent or tuition or other costs. Um, at Guelph, 23% of students were food insecure. 11% uh, of students were severely food insecure. So again, projecting out that's 3,000 students who were severely food insecure, and that means they experienced most or all of the indicators of food insecurity that we asked about. They worried about running out of food. They reduced the quantity, quality, or types of food that they eat. They were skipping meals. They were going all day without eating. Uh, they're relying on food programs rather than on conventional ways to eat. And we know the impacts that has. Uh, we know the impacts uh, it has on physical health. We know that food insecurity uh, or students who are food insecure are more likely to report uh, lower grades, more likely to take longer to complete, so we know it impacts academic performance. And we also know that it uh, that food insecurity impacts the mental health, well-being, and, and sense of belonging for students. I think we all know this intuitively, that food is social. It's more than just nutrition. Uh, it's about uh, so pe people's sense of identity, about their sense of dignity, their self, uh, self determination. It's how they engage with and express their culture. And so we try to build these things into the design of the market. Uh, next slide, please, Leah. Um, how do we do it? Uh, I think a couple of things to mention here, or three things to mention here. Collaboration has been key, collaboration between students and staff, Viv and I, for example, but there are many others. Uh, collaboration between academic and operational units. My unit is an academic unit. We had other operational units as well. And importantly, collaboration between the campus and community. Uh, one of the key partners for this work is the SEED, which is a community organization working in Guelph. They provide not only the model uh, of the siding, uh, siding scale market, which we borrowed heavily from, they provided training. Uh, we were buying our food wholesale from them. Uh, we were storing with them, storing our food with them. They provide equipment for merchandising and point of sale. Um, and then finally, uh, we we did it some, with some student-based funding, the Student Life Enhancement Fund, which we primarily used. Uh, it was ten thousand dollars. We primarily used uh, for purchasing groceries to pay for some training and some stipends. Uh, next slide, please, Leah. Um, one of the, I mean, I'll be clear, we ran this for six weeks, so we'll know more about uh, the barriers to implementation as we move to make this a more permanent program. But the primary barrier for us was how can we figure out if this will be something useful for students before we have to figure out all the logistics? Uh, I suspect many of you on the call are experts and certainly far more so than I am in the huge logistics involved in sourcing and transporting and storing and selling food. Um, by partnering with the seed, we could actually test the concept. Was this thing going to be valuable to students before having to figure out all of those logistics? Um, and in that way, we were able to prototype, prototype the market rather than run a full pilot. Um, you know, to be candid here, at one point, we were wondering whether we'd need to buy a refrigerator, which seemed not particularly sensible before we knew if this was going to be useful. Um, next slide, please, Leah. Uh, in terms of sustainability, longer term, uh, a key thing uh, about these types of markets, these sliding scale markets, is they operate on a cross subsidy model. So those that can pay a little more help to subsidize uh, those that pay the lower end of the scale that we offer. 
Um, the early signs from our market were that uh, we covered all of our produce costs. So we were spending about $1,000 a week uh, to buy per, uh, produce wholesale, and we were selling about $1,000 of, of produce. Um, obviously, and thinking longer term, that didn't cover some of the other costs. So we'll be, we'll be thinking about uh, the people costs involved and some of the infrastructure. If we don't partner with the seed longer term, then we may will need to think about some of the food storage, merchandising, signage, those kinds of things. Uh, and then the other sustainability question for us is around governance. What's the right governance structure? There are two really big things we like uh, about the market governance thus far. Uh, one is the marrying of student leadership. So students like Viv uh, with staff experience, so people like me who are around full time, who are uh, here year over year. Um, uh, I see a question in the chat. I'll just get to that in a second. Um, and then the other aspect of governance that we we're interested in was uh, in terms of shared responsibility. So uh, many of the interventions on campuses that respond to food insecurity specifically tend to be student run. And so you know, we want to maintain this uh, shared responsibility where there's students uh, like live, live in leadership positions married with with the institution. Um, so that's some of the sustainability things we are thinking about. Let me just pull up that question from Chantel. How do you determine who would pay more or less on the sliding scale? So thank you, Chantel. Um, when people uh, shop at the market, everything has a two prices. Uh, they don't have to keep track. When they go up to check out, uh, we give them a price range. So thanks for coming. Uh, $8, your price range is between $8 and $12. They say what they'd like to pay within that range. No questions asked. So uh, there's, no, there's no means test or anything like that. Uh, final slide, please, Leah. Um, so in terms of evaluation of the market, uh, two things to say here. Uh, firstly, recognizing that this is an established model in the community food movement. It's less common uh, on campuses, but if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, Community Food Centers Canada has a really comprehensive guide to setting up affordable food markets. And then in terms of campuses, uh, Ryerson ran a good food market in partnership with Meal Exchange. The University of Alberta hosted one pre-pandemic that was run by a community organization. And I know we have colleagues on the line from UBC, and uh, we've worked with them a lot on, around food security and follow a lot of their leadership. And uh, coincidentally, we both launched a similar kind of market on the same in the same week uh, this semester. Um, in terms of the impact of, the, of, of markets like this, uh, the seed who we partnered with had done uh, surveys of their own markets and found that about 50% of the visitors to the markets were able to buy more food and uh, more fruit and vegetables because of because of the markets. Um, we had an independent evaluation of our market. So three quick things to say about that in terms of numbers. Uh, we were selling about 30 different items. As I said, we were averaging about $1,000 in sales and we were averaging about 130 customers per market day. We were there on Thursdays. Our most was 173 customers and our least was about 70. And that was on St. Patrick's Day. Everyone was out enjoying the good weather. Um, final thing uh, here then is, you know, how did this market affect healthy eating? Uh, what we could see from the 200 people that completed a survey who had attended the market, 63%, so almost two thirds of everyone that came uh, said they were now buying more fruits and veggies because of the market. 20% were buying a lot more, 35% were buying a little more. Um, the good news from our point of view is that most felt they were getting enough fruit and veggies. The thing we're sitting with and challenged by is that about 10% were buying more, but it was still not enough. So I think we can feel confident uh, that the market increased access to healthy food, but there are some questions remained about what else is going to be needed for students who are likely experiencing the most severe forms of food insecurity. Uh, final slide. That's everything from us. Thank you for the time and the opportunity. Um, if you have any questions, my email is there and we're happy to answer this and, and talk a little more. Alrighty. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all for sharing the interesting insights so far. Um, next slide, please. So my name is Rohini Mohanla, and I'm the program coordinator at Meal Exchange. Today, I'm joined by three of our student ambassadors, and um, we're going to be sharing a few uh, ways in which we are encouraging healthy eating on campuses, and the three students will uh, go on into a little bit more detail on to the different ways in which they're doing that at each respective campus. Next slide, please. Um, I think we'll just skip over this one for now. So prior to going deeper into, oh, no, previous one, please. 
Yes. Prior to going into that, um, I wanted to share a little bit more about what is Meal Exchange. So we are a national charity acting as a catalyst for change by empowering students, facilitating campus collaboration, and advocating for good food. So for nearly 30 years, we are the only organization advocating for post-secondary student food, student food security across Canada. And our vision is to create resilient post-secondary communities where all students have access to good food that upholds their well-being. And so what we've seen so far in the presentation and what we're going to see um, through the stu each student's um, discussion is that every single campus brings along its own unique set of complex issues and solutions to address food insecurity. And so for this reason, it is important that we we work directly with students and campuses to uplift, uplift their voices and to advocate for changes that reflect their needs. Um, and it's through student expertise on their campus food systems and um, additional research that we're able to support them with leadership opportunities and for them to think creatively about which kinds of initiatives and projects can lead to long-term systemic improvements. Next slide, please. And so for today's discussion, um, I, we wanted to talk about one of our programs, which is the Canada's Food Guide Student Ambassador Network. This is a partnership with Health Canada's Office of Nutrition and Policy, where we work with 30 campuses nationwide. Um, and the objective of this program is for these 30 ambassadors to bridge information on healthy eating from Canada's Food Guide to their campus community by organizing activities to engage other students meaningfully. So this is a little bit of um, a macro scope of the program, um, but there are various important factors that we must consider. So firstly, um, one of the pillars is that we support it through this program, we support grassroots level student led work. So we're working with students and people who are directly impacted by the kinds of healthy eating interventions that are gonna be uh, put in place on their campuses. And one of the ways in which we do this is that the students or the ambassadors can come to the meetings uh, with Health Canada to discuss and provide feedback on Canada's food guide and then to come up with ways to host activities on their campus to spread this message. And so in this way, uh, ambassadors get the opportunity to be involved in decision making uh, in Canada's food guide and to build collaborative relationships with decision makers on their campus. And this is one of the key parts of this because in doing so we encourage students to establish and maintain long-term meaningful campus relationship and this is one of the pillars of um, ensuring that something is sustainable and can be put in practice for a longer period of time. Um, another factor that is important in this program is or something that we do at Meal Exchange as well is we do research to understand gaps in campus food systems to um, inform the initiatives. So, for example, last year, uh, fall 2021, we conducted a national food insecurity research where in over 6,000 uh, students nationwide participated to share some of the, their personal experiences with the, their campus food experience. And it's this kind of data that directs our work and allows us to figure out what kind of gaps are on um, on campuses and then to work with the students to create the changes. And so I'll pass the microphone over to one of our student ambassadors at the University of Saskatchewan so she can share a little bit about some of the work she's been doing. Hi, my name is Jordan Grantham and I'm a nutrition student and uh, the student ambassador for the U of S. I completed a few different events to promote the food guide to my community. Um, the types of events could be classified as other kind of food based events where I handed out grocery gift cards, meal kits or produce boxes to students alongside resources or social media campaigns where I shared messages, recipes and awareness about the CFG and then some community outreach as well. Ultimately, the overarching motivation for each of my programs was to increase awareness of the Canada's Food Guide and its components on my campus. But to me, it was also important that students knew where they could turn on campus for nutrition advice that was evidence-based and consistent with the Canada's Food Guide messaging. That's why I partnered with a dietitian service called Eat Well Saskatchewan for all of my social, social media campaigns and events. I also partnered with the USSU Food Centre and SHEP, a local food organization, and got support from both EWS and the USSU for um, additional events after my partnerships. Um, these partnerships were essential and helped me to improve the quality and reach of my programs on campus. Um, what I did find out actually was that social media was a really difficult tool to use when the events required participation, such as my chopped discussion event, which um, 
we pretended to be like a chopped TV show and discussed uh, different foods in the produce boxes. Um, it was a, so so social media was a simple way to spread messaging and inform information during campaigns, but it was hard to get feedback or understand the campaign impact on social media. I was able to get students to participate in my events more using university news bulletins and by emailing students directly via their colleges compared to advertising the events on social media. The main takeaway that I learned in this experience is it's essential to take the time to, and research and design programs that intentionally complement a student's schedule in life. This learning outcome occurred more so when in-person events started again. Students are busier than ever working multiple jobs and won't participate in an event if the time spent at the event is not offset by the benefit of the event. That is why I timed events when students would still be on campus in familiar locations and always tried to provide considerable amounts of food and commuter friendly bags for any person. And I also tried to keep the events under an hour. And I think the students really appreciated this. And that's what I have. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say next slide. Um, I think it's my turn. <laughs> um, so, hi, my name is uh, Maria Jade Fortin. I am a nutrition student at Laval University and a good food ambassador with Meal Exchange. Um, as you can see, my main language is uh, French, so you might hear um, my accent through my presentation. So, sorry for that. Um, in partnership with the Via Agroecology, a student committee of my faculty, um, I am setting up a fruit tree plantation to offer the community access to free fresh fruit uh, directly on campus. This project is currently undergoing uh, elaborate planning to ensure the sustainability of the trees and shrub that will be planted on the land loaned to uh, Via Agroecology and on a parcel of land directly on my campus. Uh, this project aims to begin the movement toward a long-term nourishing campus, so it focuses on integrating sustainable development as much as possible into our food practices and system. It also falls in line with the Axe Alimentation Responsable, which is a community that ensures sustainable food options and sourcing at my campus. I also work with this community to implement this project. I needed to apply for uh, multiple funds to pay for the trees and other essential things. So um, they were very uh, important stakeholders for my project. Um, it was hard to launch this project because in the past there was a similar initiative which was not implemented properly and turned unsuccessful. So I had to prove to the administration that I had a planning framework uh, with all necessary steps to make sure this project would be implemented successfully this time. And now, as I speak to you, uh, we're going to plant those trees in two weeks. So um, I'm very proud and uh, my plan and all my hard work work very well. Um, so thank you for listening to me. Have a great day. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, my name is Shimona and I'm the student ambassador for Meal Exchange for George Brown College. Um, so. It's been a very interesting experience working with Meal Exchange and for George Brown. So I think the most, uh, the biggest thing about George Brown is that there's a very high population of international students, as a result of which uh, there are a few things that we, uh, a few of a few of the events that we did, they were catered very specifically uh, to sort of keep that in mind that there is an international population, a large international population. Um, so last semester in the fall, we actually had one webinar with the speaker from Institute Paul Bocuse, and uh, they were able to speak about uh, adopting the plant-based diet. So they themselves have the, have done their research with meat alternatives and uh, lab-grown meats and isolating plant proteins and things like that. So it was a very uh, nice discussion. We even had a few professors join in, and uh, it was very engaging in terms of other than you know the tofu, the tempeh, like what else can you do that is plant-based but not entirely uh, mainstream you know um so that's what we did last semester um and something very interesting that we actually did semester was uh, a social media campaign so with one of the meetings for health canada uh, we realized that the health canada food plate itself um it needs so we uh, as a result of a discussion 
we came to the conclusion that it would be nice to have more cultural variations of the Health Canada food plate. And because Canada itself is so multicultural and diverse, uh, we wanted that to be more accessible to everybody involved uh, and using Health Canada resources. So uh, next slide, please. So as a result of that, we basically came up with the Health Canada series social media campaign. And uh, we had students who actually sent in their recipes and recreated the Health Canada food plate um, according to their cultural dishes. That was very interesting. We even had um, a giveaway of $25 gift cards. So students who sent in theirs with the recipe and the photographs, some even sent in videos of the process. Um, it was very engaging and uh, definitely we got to see some very interesting variations. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. As a final bit, I just wanted to leave you all with some of the places where you can find us and you can continue supporting these students uh, in some of the initiatives, that, initiatives they've taken up. Um, I'll also be sharing the more information in the chat. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Harini. And we like to change this. There's so much exciting stuff going on. This is fantastic. Great. Okay, so just very, very briefly, because I know we're almost out of time, we thought we would have longer, as always is the case. Um, so in terms of some of the recommendations, which kind of also act as facilitators to action, and I think this is from the literature, but throughout this, throughout all these case studies, one thing that became very clear to me was um, the amount of partnerships and stakeholder engagement and working together um, between disciplines and sectors seems really, really important. Healthy university steering committees or healthy and sustainable food working groups um, have been identified also in the research as a really um, important kind of sustainability mechanism and a kind of a, a group that will be there to make recommendations and implement actions to improve the food environment. Another interesting thing that I didn't hear during the presentations, but did come up was to reduce the number of options. So reducing the number of daily options available in dining halls has been found to reduce labor costs as well as food costs. And um, I don't, they didn't talk about how happy students were with that option, but it did talk, they did talk about kind of as a sustainability uh, mechanism to reduce the number of daily options. Um, again, of course, to consider multiple stakeholders within and outside the institution. So considering inside stakeholders like students, staff, faculty, administration, and outside. So thinking about partnerships with food producers, distributors, food service operators, um, and as well as considering multiple outcomes. So not just, of course, nutritional quality of the food sold or diet quality of the students at the on campus, but also the economic impact of the food supply and vending contracts environmental impacts of different types of foods and beverages for sale. Um, and I think some of the things that we heard that seemed like very innovative that I did not see at all yet in the literature was, I think some of the stuff we just heard about with meal exchange, which is like promoting healthy multicultural diets as well and recognizing that different cultures have different kinds of, you know, food cultures and those kinds of things and, and how to incorporate healthy eating messages that are accessible for everyone. Um, and then another thing I think that I'm seeing more in the literature that we also heard several times in these presentations was the focus on not only human health, but also planetary health and sustainable food consumption um, from an environmental sustainability perspective. So we do have a few minutes, one, two minutes left for questions. Um, I think probably some of us can, can stick around for a little while longer after that, but please, if you have questions, um, if you'd like to put them in the chat, um, and if the panelists would like to all put their uh, videos back on, that would be great. I would like before before questions start rolling in, because I have to jump off the call because I have another meeting. I would like to thank you, Leah, and thank all the presenters today for doing a fantastic job. It's very refreshing and heartwarming to see all the efforts that are being done at the local level to promote healthy eating and improve the food environment. So as the DG responsible for um, promoting healthy eating and setting the healthy eating agenda for the country, this is really, really heartwarming. So I can't thank you enough and I strongly encourage you to continue your excellent work. And je voudrais dire, il ne faut jamais s'excuser pour le français, jamais s'excuser pour l'accent qu'on a it's an asset 
and it's skilled to speak more than one language and it's one what that makes Canada a beautiful country. We all come from different backgrounds. We all, many of us have accents and we share, we should wear them with pride. Um, so thank you again. And uh, I look forward to hearing more about the efforts and the, these initiatives in the future. Thank you and back to you, Leah. Thank you very much, Alfred, and thanks for all your support of all this work. I think, yeah, especially with all the students, it's been so exciting. Thank you. Um, great. So we have some time for questions. If anyone is still here, it is one o'clock now. I have a question actually for Sam or Viv, um, and my question is, how, what proportion of people would you say? pay the full market price as opposed to the so written that eight to twelve dollar range that you talked about sam like what proportion of them pay the full versus pay lower uh we actually don't have the data on that the hard data on that the anecdotally uh i would say the uh the medium was probably slightly below the midpoint so slightly below the middle of the range o often people uh would say they want to pay in the middle um the seed has done uh, surveys in the past, where what you tend to see is there's a uh, sort of most people are playing slightly below the midpoint in whatever range they're offered. Uh, a number are paying uh, towards the lower, and then there's a few that, that a smaller number that pay the the full price or or towards the higher end. But that's enough to sustain the market. Wow. Okay. I was also surprised. I think it was maybe Jordan who mentioned that um, it wasn't. It didn't seem super successful to to use uh, social media to recruit students. That surprised me a little bit because I guess I just I guess I have some assumptions about how frequently students use social media. But I thought that was really interesting. Great. So I don't know if do any of the panelists have any additional comments they'd like to make before we wrap up. Okay, well, we will be posting this. Well, Rohini and, and Wheel Exchange will be posting this uh, webinar, this recording, a recording of this webinar. Um, and I think we'll check with all the presenters, but I'm happy to share my slides and I, I hope that everyone is okay with sharing their slides. Um, and then we could find out where to make those available as well. And we can email all the participants um, when, we, when we have the package of everything ready to send. So, Paula Brower says now for scale up. Yes, this is <laughs> this is the next challenge. Um, and I think one of the things also that was highlighted, I think is important too, that each campus has its own very unique context, um, facing its own, you know, barriers and challenges and 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 has its own assets. So I think scale up is not gonna obviously look the same, but I think webinars like this and hopefully other kinds of events like this and the coordinating work that Mail Exchange is doing. Um, does a really good job of kind of spreading those great ideas around. Oh, there's a question from Joy. Oh, read the recommendation slide. By reducing options, what's the recommendation recommended number of options? Thank you, Joy. I missed that. Sorry. Um, there wasn't a given number, but there is more of a description as well as the citation of that paper in the report that I'd be happy to send. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting thing and I really don't know how students would react. Great. Okay, so I think that's it from us. Thank you all for participating. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day uh, and week. And Angie, I think we can stop recording now. <laughs>